Hello, and welcome to Lab Roots, The Life of Her Mind, an interview series devoted to learning how women think about their research, their field, and their future. Let's get started. Today, we are in conversation with Dr. Daphna Joel, a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Tel Aviv University. Dr. Joel is a member of the School of Psychological Sciences and the Segal School of Neuroscience. Professor Joel completed her PhD in psychobiology at Tel Aviv University in 1998. She received the Alon Fellowship for Young Scientists and joined Tel Aviv University's Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience. Dr. Joel's work focuses on the relations between sex, gender, and brain structure and function. She has published over 70 papers and is the author of Gender Mosaic, Beyond the Myth of the Male and Female Brain. One of her central findings is that while biological sex is not an illusion, our binary conceptualization of sex is. Welcome, Dr. Joel, and thank you for taking time to give us a glimpse into the life of your mind. Thank you for inviting me. So um, maybe we can start with uh, what, how you found your way into psychology and neuroscience. What brought you, what led you, what motivated you? So thinking in retrospect, I think most of the, my career was led by a uh, passion. Uh, I was going after questions or topics that I found interesting and looked for ways to, or fields in which I could study these questions. So, and along the way, I started many things and left many things. So I studied the mathematics, physics, and computer science and left after a year and a half, realizing that I don't want to be any of these. And then started medical school and left after a year, realizing I don't want to be a physician. Uh, and I got to study psychology and neuroscience out of pure interest. And uh, really... And this is also what led, led me to switch after several years from what I was studying back in the beginning, um, different disorders related to the basal ganglia and uh, their relations with the frontal cortex to a completely new uh, area of study, which is sex and the brain. Do you, is, is it, I don't know if it's fair to, to ask as a, as a follow-up, do you know in retrospect or did you know at the time uh, what it was about, for example, uh, medical school or becoming a physician that that made you say, no, this actually isn't for me. And then even within um, studying psychology, neuroscience, that you gravitated to uh, studying uh, sex and gender. Well, regarding medical school, uh, I started learning uh, or started studying and this uh, the material itself was very, very interesting, but I wasn't sure about being a physician. So I went and volunteered in an emergency room and quite quickly I discovered that, yeah, this is not for me. And uh, it, it's too, um, I, I take it to heart too much, the suffering of others. And while we cannot avoid suffer and suffering of others in life, we don't have to choose this as a, you know, a profession and deal with it every day, all day. So this is why I decided not to become a doctor. Okay. And then, so maybe we can, um, what, as we talk about the, the the work that you've been doing that ended up being your specialization, um, later on, uh, uh, the connection between, you know, being as empathetic as you are and the, what you, what you envision in the, in the future for, for your field. Um, so how did you get to the neuroscience of sex and gender as opposed to where you originally started in, in uh, uh, psychology and neuroscience more generally? So just really almost by accident. So a colleague of mine and a good friend retired and she asked me to replace her given a course on the psychology of gender. And uh, because I, I have been a feminist, Although I, I never studied it officially in university, but from the moment I remember myself, I have been a feminist. So I decided, yeah, why not? I'll teach you. This is an important course to have in psychology. Um, so I sat at home almost for a year reading a lot about gender and the psychology of gender. But as a neuroscientist, I was, of course, also interested in sex and the brain. 
and knew about books like, uh, you know, the female brain, the male brain, men for Mars. Yes, I knew all of these myths. Uh, and I wanted to find out for myself. And while reading, I read into a paper, again, really by, by accident, that described sex differences in the, in the rat brain. And what they found is that when uh, the rats were stressed, the differences were reversed. Now, they framed the, this study as sex differences in the response to stress. But what I've noticed is that this means that there are stress differences, if you want, in, in sex effects on the brain. So how sex affects the brain can be opposite in different conditions, which was like, wow, this is you know, not something that I ever imagined. And just because of my surprise, uh, it first led me to understand or realize my uh, implicit assumptions regarding sex. Because, you know, most of our assumptions are implicit to us and surprise is a good opportunity to realize what they are, really are. So one is that sex effects do not reverse or change. So sex is something stable and it is always a uh, Another is a binary division. So, and which what I mean here is that uh, we, things come in two sets, and where we get these ideas are, of course, from sex effects on the reproductive system or on the genitalia, in which this is quite true. So, yes, in most people, the genitalia come in either one set of genital organs or another set, and 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 they don't change. I mean, they develop but they don't change from the male form to the female form. So uh, this study made me realize that I was using sex effects on the genitalia or the binary conceptualization of sex from the genitalia and the reproductive system while I was thinking about the brain. Mm -hmm. And this study made me realize that maybe the genitalia are not a good model mm -hmm. to think or conceptualize sex effects on the brain. So because of this study, I, I, you know, I started to look for similar studies. Maybe you know, this is an anomaly. And I found many. So you know, when, once you know what you're looking for, and, and it exists, it's a real phenomena, then you can find. And, and this really, what started my whole journey, uh, it started with a theoretical, theoretical paper in 2011 called Male or Female, Brains Are Intersex. Uh, and and only a few late, years later, I managed to understand how to study the mosaic hypothesis, probably we'll talk about it in a while, but how to study this in humans. So really, I was preparing a course on the psychology of gender and ended up really discovering a new way of thinking about sex in relation to the brain. And I think now in relation to many other sim symptoms, uh, sim uh, systems that are not the reproductive system. Okay. Okay. So if so, if I if I understand things correctly, um, our traditional assumption is that the fact of reproductive the stability, if you will, of reproductive distinctions um, makes us believe that 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 stability operates in all parts of us specifically that it is that it drives um what the way we think the way we behave what makes us feminine or masculine is that is that sort of a, a, a one way we could think about the direction of going from reproductive organs to all sorts of ways we have of thinking about sex and gender so i would frame it a little different and I think the question is how far the binary division extends beyond the genitalia. Okay. That's the question. It's not the question of how, how far sex affects extends beyond the genitalia, because we know that sex affects many systems in, the, in, in our body, not just the reproductive system. It affects the bones, cardiovascular system, fat and muscles, and the brain. So sex affects all of these systems, but the question is, do these effects add up consistently to create two distinct systems, as, it, as these effects do in the genitalia or in the reproductive system? So the question is not about, does sex affect us? Yes, it affects many aspects, but whether the binary division into fem female and male 
extends beyond the genitalia into other systems. And of course, I focus mainly about the question, does it extend into the brain and mind? And okay. what we show is that it doesn't. But, but this is an empirical question. It's really important for me to say. The mm -hmm. question how far the, the division, the binary division extends beyond the genitalia is an, an empirical question. Mm -hmm. And we develop tools to, to answer it, which weren't there. And, and the point is that previous re research, and I'm talking about hundreds of years, because the quest, this question is, you know, uh, scientists have been dealing with this from the conception of modern science. So we're talking about 17th century, right. many years. But no one ever asked this. So the binary assumption was implicit. Mm -hmm. People looked for differences, and when they found differences between humans with male in female genitalia, they concluded that this means that there is a male and a female system, a male and a female brain, mind, whatever. And we actually tested this mm -hmm. and showed that this is not true. So it doesn't hold, at least not for the brain. Oh, that's a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it, the, it's what I'm about to ask is maybe um, a bit vague. And so I'll ask the sort of the formal question that I ri originally was thinking of, and you'll tell me if I, if I'm conflating issues. So, so my, my question then is, okay, so kind of what does it look like? I think a, to talk about um, what is sex, what is sex in the brain? And um, is it, is it fair to then, sort of reformulate that question uh, as follows. What is the binary understanding of sex in the brain? Is that, is that a fair question? Yeah, we can try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let's start with the question of what is sex, which I think is really important because we use the same word for many different things. Mm. So one, we use it for the, the binary division of humans into female and male. Mm -hmm. which is based on the role in reproduction and, of course, leaves out intersex individuals. So we can talk about this later. But, but, um, but for now, let's, in reproduction, we have two types, mm -hmm. male and female. And even some intersex people, they can uh, sometimes function as male or female in terms of reproduction. Okay, mm -hmm. um, So this is one meaning of sex, the binary division. So it's sex category. Another is using, uh, using the word sex to describe a system, a biological system, which is comprised of genes and hormones. It is very loosely de uh, defined. So wh what exactly, what genes are we included in this system and what hormones are included in this system? But anyway, when we talk about sex effects on the brain, for example, we don't usually mean the fact that we have male or female genitalia. What we are thinking about is levels of testosterone, estradiol, et cetera. So this is the sex system. It's not the binary uh, categorization into female and male. Now, the binary framework that comes from the observation that humans typically uh, belong to either female or male categories in terms of reproduction, this binary understanding uh, affects or biases our perception of any other thing that is related to sex, including the sex system itself. So this is why people may talk about male and female hormones, mm -hmm. as if humans with male and female genitalia have distinct sets of hormones, which is, of course, nonsense. So, okay, so we all have all hormones, all sex-related hormones, and most of them in very similar um, levels in males and females. So estradiol and progesterone, for example, exist in similar levels in males and females, except pregnant females, mm -hmm. which are a class of their own in terms of the levels of these hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, and testosterone, which is in higher levels in males on average, but there is some overlap with females. So this idea of a distinct uh, two sets of hormones is, has no basic uh, basis in, in reality or in biology. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, in contrast to the biological, uh, the binary division of the genitalia, the sex as a system is always changing. Now we are used to think of the changes in in women in with a cycle, mm -hmm. uh, the 
uh, menstrual cycle. But, but the levels of these hormones are changing all the time in males and females, also in response to environmental stimuli and, and conditions. Okay, so the, the idea, the binary conception of sex as stable, two systems, etc., not relevant when we think of sex as a system. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we really need to get rid of the binary formulation to actually study sex, what uh, Sarah Richardson from uh, Harvard calls sex itself, mm. okay, which is the genes and hormones, etc. So this was a maybe long answer to the first question. Now, okay. No, it's lovely. Thank you. It, it clarifies uh, a lot. I, so, because for for example, I was of, often confused over the years about why, when we talk about, for example, sex hormones. There's this distinction when I had a sort of a, a vague understanding or a vague grasp that, you know, everybody has all sorts of hormones. They're not distinctly in one uh, quote unquote sex or the other. So what you've just meant, you know, talked about is is really helpful. So then, OK, so you had mentioned um the the uh, concept of of intersex people, so people with um, genitalia that's not distinct. Can you talk a bit about so what, what an intersex person is and how that person um, helps us understand just what you've mentioned, right, about uh, uh, reproductive sex versus a sex system, but also how how intersex people um, have been. Uh, mistreated certainly by the medical community, you know, given the aforementioned assumptions, the implicit assumptions that you talked about. So, so we we don't need intersex people to understand that the sex system is not binary because it is also not binary. Even if you talk about male and females that are not intersex, uh, what uh, I think intersex uh, reveal is that how. Uh, how the binary conceptualization or understanding of sex affects biology, affects reality, affects people. So, so the fact that there's some, you know, most humans produce either eggs or sperm, which is the biological definition of male and female, uh, if it didn't have such a, an important social meaning, mm. then also the issue of intersex wouldn't be of importance. Mm-hmm. Because the fact that some people with testicles, for example, uh, have a female external genitalia, as in some intersex condition, wouldn't be a thing because whether you have male or female genitalia would have no meaning. Mm-hmm. So we wouldn't be obsessed with who is female and who is male, where intersex people have a problem because you can use different definitions, uh, if, if, if it didn't have any social meaning. And, and it's quite similar, uh, for example, when people were obsessed with whether you are right-handed or left-handed. Right, yes, yeah. Yeah, not very long ago. So there were specific measures to establish whether you are right-handed or left-handed. And there were also debates about which is the best uh, method to define. And, you know, with the uh, disappearance of the importance of handedness as a social category, we, we are no longer interested in whether you are right-handed or left-handed. Uh, you will not be hired or not be hired because you are right-handed or left-handed, as used to be the case, okay? And no one cares whether you use your left hand. Uh, so with the disappearance of the importance mean, is of the social meaning of handedness, also disappeared this obsession with whether you are right-handed and left-handed, and no one would really care whether you are using your right hand for some tasks and your left leg for other tasks. And okay, yeah. so the whole I, obsession as a culture with intersex, yeah. and also, and this is more problematic, uh, the attempt to fit them into one of the boxes, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, and uh, carry out uh, surgeries, etc., on very young uh, babies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so this is a problem. So the social binary is a problem, not sex. Sex is biology. It's not a problem to, to be solved. Right, right. Yeah. So 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 we we so so people over you know hundreds of years you know, they, they, they make observations. They you know, develop uh, uh, some sort of very, you know, obviously informal, non-scientific, you know, hypothesis, and they 
that hypothesis becomes a sort of social framework for thinking about the world. And because we end up with this um, set of structures or categories, we make mistakes uh, about in, in applying those categories to, 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 to people. And those mistakes lead to things like, you know, mistreating uh, uh, people based on their, um, um, uh, there's a word that I want, I can't think of, but based on their uh, uh, ill-defined, if you will, genitalia, ill-defined according to the social right conception. Um, and so also, you know, suffering. People are um, kind of forced into ways of being that simply aren't natural. Does that yeah, but, seem like a fair summary of that? Yeah, kind but, of but, this, yeah. but this is true for all of us. Mm. Okay. We are all forced into two binary categories. Just, you know, for most people, if they're not intersex, this does not involve surgeries. Yeah. But we are all forced. So if, you know, you are a boy and someone tells you, don't cry, don't be a girl, you are forced into a category. Uh, so in this sense, we are all affected uh, and not in good ways, I think, by the binary system. And again, I, I, the problem is the binary social system. It's not whether some people have male genitalia, others have female genitalia, and some have intersex genitalia. This is not the problem. Mm. The problem is that we uh, impose on this reality, which is mixed, even at the level of the genitalia, we impose a binary system. And when people do not fit the binary system, then we, we take very strong actions against them. Mm. Intersex people, it's... It's surgery with uh, other non-conform, gender non-conforming kids, adults, etc. It's more social punishing, but we are all, you know, kept in line at all times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so yeah, I mean, there are many examples to this, but we can come back to this later. But maybe I, if you want, we can look just to see um, the idea of how how brains are not male or female, because I think you know. At least in this case, it's better to one image was a thousand words. Yes, lovely. Thank you. Okay, when you're ready. Yeah, okay. So let me share the, this. Okay. So as I, as I said, um, findings in animals that sex effects on the brain may be opposite under different conditions led me to the idea that brains will not be internally consistent in having only female typical or only male typical features, as is almost always true for the genitalia, as we've just discussed. But rather, brains would be comprised each of a unique mosaic of male typical and female typical features. And, and we analyzed by now over 20,000 human brains, the structure of over 20,000 human brains to provide a different types of evidence and using also sophisticated machine le learning algorithms, et cetera. I'm not going to go into this. I'm just going to show the basic analysis, okay? Yes. So, and, and only of a, you know, one subset of uh, brains. Mm -hmm. So what we did here is we looked at MRI images of uh, human brains, probably, you know, most people are familiar with these images, uh -huh. divided each brain into 116 regions, measured the volume of each region in each brain and wrote it down in a table like this one. And then to appreciate similarities and differences between the brains of men and women, we use the color code to paint each cell in the table. And, and the idea here is, is that a, a cell would be painted in green if mm -hmm. this region in this brain is relatively large compared to this region in all other brains, men and women combined. And a region would be painted yellow if it is relatively small compared to the volume of this region in all other brains. Okay, so this is how we painted the, the table. Mm -hmm. And when we were done, this is what we saw. Oh, wow. This, yeah, this is why, this is the wow that I, I wanted. Mm -hmm. So on the left, you see brains of men and on the right, brains of women, each line, a single brain. And the important part, the part is you don't need statistics to see that there are differences between the brains of men and women. At the group level, there's more green at the women's side and more yellow at the men's side. Mm -hmm. But you can also see at the same time that brains are rarely all green or all yellow. Mm -hmm. Instead, each brain is a unique mosaic, no two lines are the same, of green, which is more common or typical of women, and yellow, which is more common in men. Mm -hmm. 
So I think these are really important images because they help create a new um, a new framework in which it is still true that there are group level differences between males and females, but there are no two types. Mm. And usually when we hear that there are differences in the brain between the brains of men and women, we immediately conclude that this must mean that they're right, that there are male brains and female brains. And here you can see a third option. Mm. So the, the binary framework, in the binary framework, there are only two options. Either men and women are the same or they are different. And what you see here is a third option. We are all different. No two brains are the same. So, so, so this is a, I think this is why this is so powerful for me, because it really provides a new framework of thinking about sex effects on whatever, in this case, the brain, yeah. and getting out of the binary framework, which restricts us to only two solutions. Either we are the same or we belong to two types. Mm -hmm. And here we see that neither is correct. We are not all the same because everyone is different, but truly we do not belong to two types. Okay? Yes. Uh, so this is what I wanted uh, to show here. So then, so this then is, um, I don't know if foundation is the right word. I mean, you, you'll tell us, but this is um, the mosaic, right? So I was going to ask you, so so what is the mosaic brain? You have obviously your findings, but you're also um, mounting a project uh, to, to help us understand uh our own brains as as mosaic brains so so what is the mosaic brain and what is the project the mosaic project okay so the mosaic brain you just saw yes. so it's a uh, understanding that brains are comprised of mosaics each a unique mosaic i think it was also very clear in the images that every line is different or each line is different and um, so the idea that each brain is a mosaic of male typical and female typical features uh, and also in subsequent studies, we showed that, uh, again, this is using really different uh, methods of deep learning or machine learning or whatever you want to call them, uh, that sex provides no information mm. on the differences and similarities between two brains. Mm. So the fact, for example, that we both have female genitalia doesn't mean that our brains are more similar than the brains of each of us and any other male, mm. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is, of course... In, in complete opposition or contradiction to what we know about the, the genitalia. The mm -hmm. fact that, you know, we are both female, so we share a very similar uh, reproductive system, which is very different from the system of any male. But in the brains, it's not only not, a, not exactly like this, it's, it doesn't exist. So sex, knowing someone's sex category, provides no information of how their brain would be similar or different from yours. Mm -hmm. So this is regarding the brain. What we also uh, showed, and now we are extending this, uh, is that this is also true, and I think you know most people know this, this is also true of gendered characteristics. Mm. So if you go to psychology, preferences, attitudes, behaviors, etc., and you look for features that do show gender differences for whatever reason, and, and note that I do not discuss the question of nature versus nurture at all. Okay, so there are differences. I don't know why, but they are there. But then if you look at the individual, each of us possesses both feminine and masculine characteristics. Okay, it's very, at least in our studies, it's very rare to meet someone that has, has only feminine or only masculine characteristics. And, and what we are doing now, and let me show you, is, is indeed, a, we developed, uh, it's really only now started the operating and it's still quite a better site, but, mm -hmm. uh, but we developed this uh, website and the Gender Mosaic Questionnaire in which people can explore their own gender mosaic and learn about gender. And, and what we do is first they uh, you know, answer a set of questions about attitudes, preferences, and behaviors. And uh, just to give an example, for example, when choosing a romantic partner, how important is it to, uh, that your partner is rich? Mm -hmm. and, and please, you know, you and, you and our listeners, please choose a number between zero, unimportant, and four, indispensable. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back to this answer in a minute. Mm -hmm. And after they complete the answering the question, they receive a feedback 
on each trait, on how feminine or masculine they are on each trait, compared to people around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, what's considered masculine or feminine differs across cultures. Mm -hmm. So I can explain how we define this, and I think we learn about gender also from, from how we define this. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we gathered the data for now already from over 10 countries on the same questionnaire. Okay, and we have a set of 1,500 people from each country. And this is, for example, the distribution of the answers for 1,500 people from Japan to the question that we all just answered. Mm -hmm. And men's answers are in blue, women's answers in red. Mm -hmm. And we can see that there is a difference. Okay, we can see the group level difference. And specifically, we can see that more women than men chose answers two, three, and four. So we would consider these answers feminine. Mm -hmm. And if this was your answer, then in your mosaic, the corresponding square would be red or pink. Mm -hmm. In contrast, question, answer zero is more common among men than women. So it be, would be considered masculine and marked in blue. Mm -hmm. And finally, answer one it, it was similarly chosen by, by men and women. So it's neither feminine nor masculine. It's gender neutral. So it will be painted in yellow. Mm -hmm. Simple. Mm -hmm. But what will happen if instead of comparing your answer or the participants' answer to the Japanese sample, we compared it to the answers of 1,500 Americans? Okay, so this is this, their distribution. And we can see that in this sample, there was hardly any difference between the answers of men and women to this same question, mm -hmm. making all answers gender neutral. Yeah. So regardless of how much you, you know, how important it is to you that your romantic partner is rich, now the corresponding square in your mosaic would be yellow. Yeah. And when participants finish, this is what they get. So yeah. this is my mosaic. And when my answers were compared to the American sample. So you can see in my mosaic in some traits, I'm feminine or slightly feminine. On others, I'm masculine or slightly masculine. And on some gender neutral. Okay. And this is my mosaic when it is compared to the Japanese sample and to an Israeli sample. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, remember that my answers have not changed. Yes. What is causing the change from each panel is the definition of each trait as fe of my answers, of feminine or masculine, in comparison in, in the specific culture. Yes, yes. So, so what you can learn here is first about your own gender mosaic and you can explore and, you know, every square you touch, it will open what, what feature it is and, and why it is colored this way and some fun facts about this. Um, but So you can learn about your unique mosaic. You can see how you change in whether you are feminine, masculine and what in comparison to different uh, groups, comparison groups. Mm -hmm. And also you can learn about gender Mm -hmm. and, and the cultural dependence of gender, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So on some traits, I, I, I change, you know, from being masculine to being feminine. Right, and It's right. the same answer, but, but whether it's considered masculine or feminine has changed. And just a fun fact, because we already have some, quite a lot of answers, so this is my uh, mosaic, uh -huh. and of course, I'm not unique, and you can see these are the results of other people. So you can see, wow. you know, and, and again, what you can appreciate here is how everyone is different. So no two mosaics, like the brain, no two mosaics are, are the same. And instead of celebrating this, you know, wonderful variability, what our society is trying to do is take this, you know, huge variability and compress it into two boxes, mm -hmm. blue and red, boys and girls, women and men, etc. Mm -hmm. So... So, so this is uh, the aim of the project, and of course, uh, it's uh, it's designed both to provide in a very uh, fun way uh, the idea of the mosaic and uh, a more complex understanding of gender or more critical understanding of gender, especially the binary, uh, the gender binary, and of course, we we will uh, gather information about people's attitudes, uh, behaviors, etc. And we can further explore this uh, interesting topic. Oh, that I, so I did visit the, the site and I filled out the questionnaire. What I, if, if memory serves, what I didn't do was look at the um, cross-cultural comparisons. And what I, what I found stunning about your, about just the visual representation of, 
your brain compared with other brains from other countries is that, like you say, depending on how the culture um, sort of defines uh, uh, gender, um, you get, you you change. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right. So that leads me so so i hope oh yeah i hope people will 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 go to the uh the gender mosaic website and will and we'll make sure that we have the the link uh, up again and, but, and i can i can also say that it's not only in english i mean the website is only in english but the questionnaire is available in 10 different languages so oh, you can you know so many people around the world can do it in their own language uh, so we can you know they can be more accurate and uh, so, so two two questions about the Gender Mosaic project. One is um, a question about where, kind of, what the the if there is an endpoint to the to the project in terms of amassing data, right? What is that? If there is one, what is it? Um, and then, and then the other question is, uh, what do what do you envision for a a future in which we successfully break out of binary thinking about gender. Okay, so so let's start with the first question. So luckily and gladly, I recently received an ERC advanced grant, uh, which also supports this project. So uh, this will allow me, you know, to to keep the website alive. For, for longer, and uh, this already allowed me to translate the questionnaire into more languages, etc. So, so I'm really glad, really glad. And my vision is that the questionnaire is, you know, the website is there, and people can com- continue to enjoy it for as long as I have uh, the funds to to keep it uh, active. Uh, in terms of the of the research, you know, the more the merrier, of course. Uh, and uh, already the data that we have is very interesting in terms of cultural differences in so many aspects, just in the in the things that we measure and then gender differences in the different uh, traits, etc. So there is plenty of data there. And of course, the, the plan is that it will be available for re- researchers throughout the, the world, not just to us, so it can serve the, the entire scientific community. Uh, and we, of course, are focusing mainly on questions related to the mosaic and things like this. Uh, but but there is so much data there. I mean, and we are just starting that I'm sure others can benefit. And I'm welcoming any type of collaboration uh, regarding this. So this is uh, one part. The, the question about a world without uh, gender, which is indeed my uh, my vision. Uh, and I think if you remember uh, the three... Uh, my three mosaics, different mosaics in different cultures. And you look at it and you really think, you know, this is absurd because I'm the same person with my unique set of uh, attitudes, abilities, and preferences. Yet whether these are considered appropriate to people with my type of genitalia varies across cultures. So, and clearly different cultures value some attitudes and preferences differently. But the question is why should such judgments depend on whether we have male or female genitalia. And and this for me is the most important uh, point. Uh, And, you know, when you look at all the mosaics that each of us us is, and the huge variability, uh, I think many people can share my uh, vision. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be much better if we they lived in a world in which each of us could live according to their unique mosaic of abilities and preferences rather than according to the type of genitalia we have. Uh, so I, I think, you know, when you look at this and when you appreciate that not only you are a mosaic, because I think people know this about themselves. Everyone can name a few feminine and a few masculine characteristics. I think what people do not know, and I hope, you know, the website will help and our conversation will help, is realizing that everyone is mosaic. So it's not that something is wrong with me, that I have, as a female, have some masculine traits or as a male have some feminine. Everyone is like this. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can start celebrating this variability instead of trying to, you know, uh, deny it, uh, suppress it in us and in others. Mm -hmm. 
And because I know it's, it's difficult to imagine a world in which sex carries no social meaning, it's just, you know, one of our physical attributes like I don't know, eye color or handedness. Mm -hmm. So actually the example that I give is handedness. Yes. Because from something so important, you know, like 50 years ago, if parents or teachers were noticing that the kid was using the left hand, they used to tie that hand. So the kid had to use the right hand. And also think of the word, the right hand, right and wrong, right and left. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's so much in our language. And it disappeared. Mm -hmm. No one cares today, you know, whether the, uh, the U.S. president was left-handed. This wasn't a big deal. It was a big deal that he was black, not that he was left-handed. Okay, so... I wish also color, uh, skin, you know, color, the color of the skin would lose its social meaning. And so I, I wish the form of the genitalia would lose its social meaning. Mm -hmm. It is important in some situations, uh, whether you have female or male genitalia, mainly situations re related to reproduction. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a baby and you want to achieve this by having sex with someone else, then you need to know what type of genitalia you have and what type of genitalia the other person has. But but the importance of sex in our society extends, you know, far beyond reproduction. Mm -hmm. And this is what I want to get rid of. Thank you so much for this incredibly illuminating uh, conversation about uh, uh, sex, gender, and the the reality of our mosaic brains. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel. We appreciate your time and expertise. Before we end, is there anything that you're thinking about that that we haven't covered that you would like to to share with our viewers and listeners? Yeah, maybe one last thing. And this is that you know people in our culture as a whole are obsessed with the question of gender differences, mm -hmm. whether they exist and where they come from, etc. And people often ask me whether in a world without gender, mm -hmm. there would still be group level differences between humans with male and female genitalia. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to say something about this because I think it's important. And my answer always been and always will be that I have no clue. So <laughs> I don't know. Whether in a world without gender, there would still be group level differences between the brain and behavior, etc., of humans with male and female genitalia. But I am certain that in a world without gender, we simply wouldn't care. Mm. And that's the important point. And, and why should we care? If I love, I don't know, practicing martial arts, which I do, mm. why should I or anyone else care whether it's more common in humans with male or female genitalia? We don't care whether it's more common with human with, I don't know, blue or brown eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the important point about this is that we don't care about this, not because there are many studies showing that there are no differences between humans with blue and brown eyes. We don't care because eye color carries no social meaning. So that's the point. A world without gender is not a world in which everyone is the same. Actually, it's the opposite. Which we, it's a world in which we celebrate diversity and variability, but it's a world in which we do not care mm. whether there are group level differences between humans with this or that type of genitalia, eye color, mm -hmm. skin color, etc. And and I hope you know people realize mm. uh, why this is a much better future than the very restrictive mm -hmm. social structure that we call gender binary in which we all live now. That's a fascinating point that when we shift our thinking to align with the, the empirical facts, <laughs> um, the sorts of questions that reflect binary thinking, those end up dissolving. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so very much for, again, for your time and expertise. And I hope we'll be able to meet again and check in on how the uh, Gender Mosaic Project is going. Thank, Thank you. you.